Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're returning to Psychiana and it's Lesson 5. It is not mandatory that you've listened to the other lessons in this wonderful course in Reality Creation. This particular one continues with the lessons we've learned so far, which have included some amazing affirmations and some teachings on accessing the God law and creation as we know it. Lesson 5 by Dr. Frank B. Robinson Dear friend and fellow student, here is Lesson 5. It is one of the most intensely interesting lessons you have ever read, and I want you to read it many times over and then quietly lay it to one side and try and imagine some of the enormous truths this lesson teaches. There are distances and planets so far away that the human mind cannot begin to grasp these distances. But no matter how far we get from this globe, we find still existing and operating with unerring precision the same mighty law that we are trying to find here. The study of the heavens and the stars is a very fascinating study, so learn this lesson well and be sure to notify me of the progress you are making, especially if you experience any difficulty in grasping these lessons. More than anything else, I want you to absolutely understand the workings of the God law, which can and will and does provide every material thing necessary for one's happiness since it is understood and correctly used. Sincerely, your friend, Frank B. Robinson. At this point in our studies, I'm going to take you with me on a little trip into the marvelous realm of the sky. We are going to discover some staggering facts in this realm of astronomy. You may wonder what astronomy has to do with your understanding of the God law, and I shall tell you, for it has very much to do with it. There is no realm or part of the universe which offers to men and women such a vision of the creative intelligence that this celestial dome above us called the heavens does. And it is quite necessary that you get a glimpse of the magnitude of the handiwork of the Creator before you can understand to the very full just how mighty a power you have working with you. Before we go into this realm, however, let us look back for a moment or two over the road traveled together so far. It is an interesting road and one that is full of surprises. Practically every lesson you receive will contain some new glimpses or some new facts of the creative spirit, which is responsible for the entire creation, including you and me. Better than all, however, you will discover to be a fact that as you learn of this mighty God law, you will find yourself automatically putting it into practice. You will find yourself almost unconsciously grasping and using the principles that I lay before you, which principles are part of this mighty law after a while, and when you have progressed further, it will become second nature to you to live your life day by day, month by month, with the consciousness of the fact that you are throwing into action in your daily life and affairs the most potent and dynamic power in creation. At this stage of our journey, I do not expect, of course, that you will be able to grasp this law in its entirety, nor can I show you all at once. I must take it up step by step along the way, and you, of course, will intelligently follow me and will, to the best of your ability, meet me more than halfway and help me to help you to be complete master over every circumstance of life and to shape circumstances and conditions that instead of them mastering you, you master them. In lesson one, you saw that there existed an unseen dynamic power or force known by the name of the God law. You had never known anything about the existence of this God law before because it had never been called to your attention by anyone. Then you saw that it was necessary to discard whatever preconceived notions of God you may have had. If those notions clashed with the revelations of this God law, which I am explaining to you, I told you also in lesson one to make up your mind very definitely what it is that you need to make you happy, successful, and healthy. If you have not settled your mind definitely on this point, let me urge you right here to be sure and fix definitely right now in your mind one specific thing that you need. Place 
an objective before you, a reasonable objective, and never forget what this one specific thing is. I gave you a little mental exercise to do at night and told you to utterly relax, filling the lungs to their utmost capacity without straining them and then slowly exhale. I told you to close your eyes and repeat many times a certain sentence. In the next lesson, I showed you that whatever cards had been dealt you in the game of life might be changed by you if you did not like them. Furthermore, in lesson two, I reiterated the statement that the greatest unseen power in existence is here for your daily use. You will remember too, I called it a sleeping giant. And I told you that once this sleeping giant were harnessed to your life, nothing would be impossible for you. You will remember that I spent some time on a thought. I told you that a thought was actually a literal thing, an entity. I told you that thoughts were the most powerful and dynamic things in existence. And I showed you also that a thought is part of the great spiritual law we are trying to find in these lessons. I explained to you that you cannot think of two things at the same time. And you understand that whatever thought it is which occupies your mind more than any other thought will be the predominating and molding influence in your life. Then again, you will remember that I told you that you were the general manager of your own brain, having absolute say as to what thoughts you should not entertain. I showed you very clearly and asked you never to allow any negative or fear thoughts to roost in your hair. They will, like little sparrows, probably light there once in a while. But you can prevent them from building a nest there. Then in lesson three, I emphasize the fact that this mighty God law was responsible for all creation, including you. It did not make you and then leave you alone to shift for yourself, but it is staying right here with you, waiting to be used by you for the achievement of every good and right thing you can desire. Then again, you will remember I told you that you were laying the foundation of the things you desire to manifest in your life in the future. I told you that you are what you are today as the result of what you and others thought years ago and furthermore informed you and you know it yourself for that matter that what you will be in the future depends almost entirely on what you are thinking today. So you see how vitally important it is for me to direct your thoughts into the proper channels. You will remember I painted a picture of an architect first thinking of a building into existence in his own thought realm. And I showed you furthermore that by far the most important realm in life is the unseen spiritual thought realm. I called your attention to the fact that in this building for the future, you should hold an attitude of expectancy because it would be too bad if you missed the goal just simply because you did not expect to happen the thing you wanted to happen. Most of the world's leading scientists today have gone on record and stated that the unseen forces of nature instead of material atoms govern all nature. This being the fact, we find that immaterialism has replaced materialism as a scientific concept. I think I can safely say to you that the thinking minds of the universe are entirely agreed on the fact that there is in existence some kind of spiritual power or other which has far more to do with the manifesting of material things than we had ever dreamed of today. The religionist claims this power to be his peculiar God and he tells us that no other system of religion can possibly know anything about God at all. You and I know, however, that present-day religionists know very little, if anything, of any unseen spiritual power which can really do actually here and now whatever is necessary for the physical comforts of man. These religionists are ex experts in telling you what this great power of theirs can do after you die, but they are not so sure that this power has any ability to do anything for us now. But at the same time, the feeling seems to be that some outside power of some sort is the great controlling factor in life. And they are perfectly correct. The trouble is, they have made the mistake of thinking that this mighty power was disclosed by supernatural relation to some man or group of men ages ago. But this is not a fact. You will remember that Shakespeare stated that more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. I think it was Shakespeare who said that. At any rate, someone said it, and there probably is a lot of truth to it. The point I'm leading up to is that no matter in what realm of research we engage, 
Back of it all, we find the suspicion that the unseen spiritual realm may be responsible for the material realm. This is a fact, and it has fallen to my lot to be the man to call attention nationally and internationally to the fact that this potent dynamic God law is not in the sky, and not for the future, but for us here and now. The world's greatest physicists, men who, like Mr. Oliver Lang, have gone into the physical realm as far as it is humanly possible to go, and they are being forced to the conclusion that away beyond, far past the physical realm, something unknown is going on, and they don't know what it is. A little later, we shall go to quite some depth into this fascinating subject of the connection between the material and the unseen realm. Then in Lesson 4, you will remember... I told you the story of creation of this universe, according to the Bible book used by the Christians. Practically every so-called superhuman or divine book tells the same story, and as a matter of fact, they all contain a human understanding of the spiritual law as it operated in the creation of the universe. You will recall that you saw very plainly that God is spirit, and furthermore we saw that spirit is life capable of existence without physical form or invisible life. Be sure and grasp these statements, one after another, for we are beginning to get now to the realm in which we shall learn the secret of this marvelous invisible life. I do so wish every student of mine could instantaneously grasp the fact of invisible life. A great many of you will do that, and there are others who will require quite some time before they fully grasp that statement. But that is the fact of existence and the fact of God just the same. And furthermore, in the manifestation by you of the things you need to make you healthy, happy, and successful, you will have to realize the facts or you will never get to first base in your studies with me. Let me explain here a little bit why I asked you to center your vision on a light area, which everyone sees when their eyes are closed and when they are looking through their eyelids, so to speak. We have seen that thoughts are spiritual unseen things. We have also seen that there is invisible life throughout the entire universe, millions of light years away, and yet so close to you and to me that we could not get away from this invisible life, even if we wanted to. Now, if a thought is an invisible spiritual thing and a part of the invisible spiritual life, which it is, then do you not see that through your thought realm, you will be able to contact this invisible life spirit that I am talking about? Now, once more, if this theory is correct, that the greatest forces in the world are spiritual forces, are unseen forces, and if it be a fact that nothing was created in the material form without first being created in the thought realm, then do you not see by building your future in your thought realm, you are actually building it in a realm which will shortly change into the material realm. This is absolutely a scientific fact and a scientific spiritual law. I do not think I have ever seen the power of thought more strongly manifested than I saw it manifested last week. In Spokane, Washington, a certain theater showed a certain picture. I went in to see the picture, and it was one of the most gruesome things that I have ever looked upon. Outside of that theater were patrol wagons and ambulances taking people to the emergency hospitals for treatment. Some of them fainted while others became hysterical and fell limp on the floor. Now let us analyze this a little before we go into our realm of stars. All those people who fainted knew perfectly well that they were only looking at a picture. They knew that this thing was not happening in real life. In other words, it was entirely through their thought realm that this picture was grasped. And yet that thought realm and the thoughts entering it were sufficient to absolutely lay their bodies cold on the floor. If you receive a telegram informing you that a certain loved one has been found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to be hanged, on receipt of that telegram you turn white. Your physical body is absolutely changed, yet it was through the medium of your thought realm that this physical effect was caused. You probably became quite ill and had to go to bed as a result of receiving that telegram, but the telegram may have been untrue as far as you know, and someone may be playing a practical joke on you. You have positively no way of knowing whether your friend was found guilty of murder or not. And yet, through the medium of what is commonly called your mind, your physical body has been made ill. So then I say it is a fact that the thought realm is by far the most important realm known to man. Probably, the future will disclose the fact that it is the only realm there is, the material realm being but a very minor and unimportant part of it. 
Now, before you go into our study of the marvelous realm of astronomy, let me impress upon you once more the importance of following me earnestly and closely in these studies. I'm going to show you absolutely the existence of the God Law, and I am going to show you that it can be used in the life of every individual who is earnest enough for success and happiness to use it. So keep busy on this course of instruction and don't be afraid to do the things I ask you to do. They are very simple little things and yet are fraught with a dynamic power. And it is the actual doing of these things that brings the material results. There is no question that these lessons are interesting from a literary standpoint, but it will make more than that to obtain anything of the spiritual realm. It will take an active desire, an active will, an active intelligence, which means business before actual material results will be seen. But the little effort required is very much worthwhile. And I think you will agree with me that if you desire the good things of life, you certainly should be in earnest to at least put yourself so in tune with the spiritual law that these good things can actually come to you. For I want to repeat here that there are positively no limitations of any sort or kind to the power of the creative life spirit or God law responsible for this universe. Our trip into this realm will be very interesting and highly entertaining. I shall give you facts and figures that your mind cannot possibly grasp, but you'll be able to glean from these facts and figures something of the magnitude of the God law, which is even now, as you read this, waiting to be applied in your life for the purposes of bringing into manifestation for you and yours those things which are needed in order that you be complete in all around success. This is my only reason for showing you a few of the marvels of the skies and truly wonderful marvels they are. You must never attempt to tell me that the creative intelligence which was responsible for the vastness of yonder heavens and its millions and perhaps billions of stars, planets, satellites, etc., is not able to bring into your little life the things you need. For compared with that starry vault with its celestial treasures, you and I are mighty small fry, brother and sister. And yet we are really greater than them all. For these marvels are all perfectly inanimate. They possess no intelligence of their own. They cannot think. They cannot create. They can only revolve in their orbits in accordance with the creative law, which placed them there and which ordained their actions since the beginning of time. They do, however, give us a faint glimmer, perhaps, of the very magnitude of both creation and the Creator, and this magnitude should be enough to make you and me wonder what it's all about. Remember here, however, that throughout all this marvelous interstellar space and surrounding all these mighty suns and stars and planets, there is like a belt of living electricity, the famous cosmic ray. Don't forget that, and as I paint you this picture of the starry heavens and take you on a little trip through that realm, don't forget that the existence of these rays is an absolute proven fact. As we travel together through this marvelous realm of the heavens, you will see how foolish was the old Christian idea of both God and the heavens. In olden days, the heavens were supposed to be a solid dome with lights suspended from it. This solid dome had windows in it. When it rained, God opened the windows of heaven and let the water through. This is the method we are told he used when he suddenly discovered that he had made a mistake when he created man and drowned them all out by a flood, leaving only one man and a few animals here on the earth. These good old Christians believed that the sun, which they alluded to as the greater light and which was hung in the heavens to light this earth in the daytime, was the only sun in existence. Then they told us that their good book said that the moon, the lesser light, was put up there hanging in the sky to give us light at night. They told us also that the earth had four corners and was flat. They told us that over this earth was an immense body of water, which water it was that came down when God opened the windows of heaven or decided to drown the inhabitants from off the face of the earth. I mention these facts here only to show how ideas of God change. No idea of God can ever be permanent and lasting idea, for the human race is evolving from its past into its glorious future. There never was any fall of man in the accepted sense of the word. Quite to the contrary, there has been a steady rise of man. And the end is certainly not yet, for only now are men and women beginning to get a faint glimpse 
of the mighty power this creative spirit has for them. Only now are many of the good Christians beginning to suspect they have been accepting as gospel truth is no more than fable and allegory. It has taken a long time for that knowledge to break upon them, and it is not yet broken to the full, but they are suspecting it. They see this and other works going all over the world, and they see reason and sense and results in them, and they begin to analyze their story a little. I think it is safe in passing to say that if those teachings, this fall of man and resurrection and ascension story, would analyze it one-tenth as well as they pick flaws in the arguments against it, it would not last twelve months. This they will not do, however. They are right, and everyone else is wrong. If you don't find salvation their way, you never find it. Let me leave another thought with you here, student, and let this thought take hold of you and grip you. If you will do that, you will never again fear hellfire or the loss of your poor soul. I promise you that. This thought is right in line with our studies and will give you a lot of comfort, as it has given me just that. Here is the thought. If the God law is responsible for a man's existence, it is responsible for his actions and for everything else that happens to him. Think that over carefully. As I hinted a few lessons back, this great God law brought you into being. It did it in its own way. It required none to help, and it did a perfect job too. Now, that being the case, this God law equipped you as you are equipped and that also being the case, this God law is entirely responsible for you and your present and your future. Don't forget that. I shall come to it again. Just here, however, let me leave the thought that this mighty God law is able and willing to do and should normally do just that. More of this later, however, for I want to take you with me now onto our little trip through the heavens. And when you return, you will probably have a far different conception of the God law than you have had previous to your beginning your studies with me. Instead of this earth being the entire creation, and instead of the heavens being a solid inverted bowl with water on the other side of it, we find that this earth is but one of a series of planets which is revolving around the sun. The ancients told us the sun revolved around the earth because they said Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, and therefore the sun must move around the earth, and so they held. Science, however, has very effectively proven that this is not the case. Many of the world's heroes, however, were put to death and tortured by those professing to be God's agents for stating that the earth moved around the sun, which it does. Remember Copernicus, Galileo, and how they were tortured for their absolute scientific findings, which are now proven to be so boundlessly correct. They were right, however, even though their theories were antagonistic to supernaturally revealed religion. If you were to take an orange and stick in it several toothpicks around the diameter, and at the end of each toothpick stick a pea, and then revolve the whole on its axis, you would have a picture of this earth in comparison to this one sun of ours. If you look up into the heavens, however, you will find there are not only a few other suns, but over 20 million of them, and each sun probably the center of a planetary system, as is ours. So let's get away from the theory that this earth is the center of the universe. It isn't as much as a grain of sand on the seashore when compared with the immense distances which are known to exist in the heavens. Every single star you see is a sun, and the light from many of them took millions of years to even reach this old globe of ours. And you must remember that light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles a second. So try to conceive, if you can, which you can't, of a distance so great that the light from the star traveling at the rate of 186,000 miles a second took many millions of light years to reach this earth. Then remember that a light year is the distance a ray of light traveling at this rate of 186,000 miles a second could cover in one year. Such distances as that are inconceivable to you. Then again, when looking up into our solar system, we are apt to make the mistake that it is the only solar system there is. But this is also not a fact, for even as far as the mightiest telescope will reach, we see millions of such suns. And then, when a more powerful telescope is manufactured, we find still more millions of suns beyond those we saw before and so on through this immense canopy of heaven. Shall we spend a few moments examining this sun of ours? Then let us remember that there are in yon starry vault many millions of such suns, 
many times as large as ours, then one even faintly begins to realize the fact that there is a controlling law or intelligence behind such a stupendous scheme of creation. It makes one wonder certainly what can happen to the human life, fortunate enough to find and use the law responsible for such a vast creation. Our sun is a sphere of fire. The flames from it are leaping into space for a distance of 150,000 miles in places. This is five times the circumference of this earth. Can you imagine such a creation as that? And yet it was created for your benefit. It was created to make life possible for you and realize that some intelligence or law made this remarkable body of fire to protect you and make it possible for you to live. For you could not exist one minute were there no sun in yonder heavens. This sun of ours is approximately one and one quarter million times as big as this earth in volume. If you take the eight planets of which the earth is only one and put them all together, the sun would outweigh them all about 750 times. Imagine such a globe of fire as that is. The circumference around the sun is about two and one half millions of miles, and it takes about 26 days to revolve on its axis. This means that its revolution is at the rate of about 4,000 miles an hour. Picture that in your mind's eye, if you can. Were there no sun, it would be absolutely impossible for life of any sort to exist on this earth or on any of the other planets which this sun heats. Incidentally, you might remember here that one of the planets, Mercury, is 40 million miles from the sun, and this is the nearest of these planets. The farthest away is Neptune, whose distance from the sun is only 3,000 miles, that's all. This puts Neptune 70 times farther away from the sun than is Mercury. It only takes Mercury three months to make a trip around the sun. It takes Neptune 160 years to make his little trip around the sun. These eight planets, which form our intermediate planetary sphere, are divided into two groups of four each. There is an inner group and an outer group, and the inner group is by far the smaller of the two groups. In between these groups we have our galaxy of the asteroids. These asteroids are about three times as far from the sun as the Earth is. Then, still comprising a part of our solar system, is another system of moons or satellites as we call them, and these revolve around some of the smaller planets. It is interesting to note here that the roundness seems to be one of the outstanding characteristics of nature. Everything in nature seems to be either round or go around for those who might think that this earth with its planetary system is all of the eternal scheme of things. I might say that with the exception of Mercury and Venus, every one of these eight planets has its own solar system. We call them Martian system, the Jovian system, the Saturnian system, comprising Saturn and his rings and satellites. Then we run into another class of celestial visitor known as comets. These fellows are very eccentric gentlemen, and their orbits are very eccentric orbits. We can only see them as they approach the sun. Some few years ago, I received a call from a gentleman in Tucson, Arizona, where I was living at the time, inviting me to visit the observatory that evening after dark. I was happy to do so, and shall never forget the sight I saw. It gave me an understanding of God that I have never had before. I saw something of his magnitude, something of his power, and as I left that university building, I felt serenely safe in trusting my whole life into the hands of such a God law, for that is what it is in reality. It never was a personality, and it never can be a personality. You cannot compass such creation in terms of personality. They are too big. At any rate, stepping to the objective of the huge telescope, Dr. Douglas directed my view to a certain part of the field of vision, asking me if I saw there a tiny pinhead of light. I saw it and advised him to that effect. Do you know what this is? The good astronomer asked me. I replied in the negative whereat he informed me that it was the planet Uranus. Then followed some interesting facts about Uranus. Here I was looking through a piece of glass and was enabled to see a planet, the diameter of which is nearly 31,000 miles and the volume of which is 60 times that of this earth. The distance I was covering that night with my eyes was 1,782 million miles, and yet with the aid of the telescope, I was able to actually see that distance. Think of that. Here I was looking at an object 1,782,000 miles away, and seeing it, in any case, 
any student questions the measurement of the distances, etc., of those planets, let me say that their distances are measured with scientific accuracy. The speed of them can also be measured accurately as is necessary. Also, the speed with which they travel can be measured. Recently, a new planet was discovered, a hitherto unknown nebula, existing at a greater distance from the Earth than any heavenly body heretofore recorded. The discovery was announced by the observatory on Mount Wilson, just outside of Los Angeles, California. The nebula was discovered on a photograph taken by the 100-inch reflector on that mountain. I have seen that instrument many times. This photograph, by the way, broke all records for long-distance photography known to science to date, for it fixed the distance of this nebula at 120 million light-years from the Earth. Think of that, my friend. 120 million light-years, not miles, away, and still we can see it on a photographic plate. In addition to having photographed an object farther away from the Earth than any other object yet were photographed, this telescope achieved a second honor in that it photographed an object that is traveling through space at a velocity of 60% greater than anything ever before measured by speed. Dr. Adams, director of the observatory, states that this newly found nebula is flying through space at the rate of 11,000 miles a second. Think that over some of you people who think that the God law which created the very things I am talking about cannot help you to either wealth, health, or happiness. At this velocity, it is traveling at the rate of 6 billion miles a year. And were it traveling earthward, it would require 120 million years to reach this world. And yet, the old Christian believes that the sky was an inverted solid bowl with windows in it through which the rain came. I think you will agree with me that there certainly is an upward evolution in man instead of any fall. The most interesting thing about this new nebula, however, is that it is a great universe of stars, millions and billions of them, infinitely great in size. The speed of the nebula was measured by means of the spectroscope. Professor Humason found that its spectrum lines were red, so that a recession of 11,000 miles a second was indicated to show such a shifting of the lines would require a velocity greater by 60% than any so-called velocity yet noted. Information of this find was cabled to Dr. J.C. Merriam, president of the Carnegie Institute at Washington, D.C., who said, It is of a special interest at this time because of the bearing it will have on Dr. Einstein's conception of the universe. You know folks, somehow or other, in the face of statements like these, I just simply can't imagine the mighty creative power sitting in heaven with Jesus Christ at his right hand, making intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Somehow or other, I just don't seem to be able to get that. And yet it is what is being taught today in this land as the truth of God. And maybe it is. Maybe God is seated up there somewhere with his son at his right hand pleading for us mortals down here. I'm not saying that he is not. I may be counted an infidel and everything like that, but I just simply don't believe it. That's all. I have no quarrel with those good folks who say they do believe it, no quarrel at all, and the only reason I'm calling attention to it here is because before men and women can see anything of the marvels and the glories of the creative God law behind this universe, it will be absolutely essential that untrue stories about him be discarded. This old world is trembling, even as I write this, on the brink of a volcano. We do not know what moment it will blow us into a terrible conflagration, and by way, if one should come now, don't make any mistake, brethren, it will be a dandy. And it is my contention that as long as you and I are asked to believe anything foolish or unreasonable about God, then just so long will men and women miss the power of the God law. Let's get our eyes away from such stories as the six-day creation, the spit and dirt story, the wholesale drowning story, the fall of man story, the resurrection story. And let's get our eyes on the power that is. Let's recognize a little bit just what sort of a law we have working with us. Then, when men and women grasp the larger picture, they won't lack for anything, for they will have learned, as you are to learn, how this mighty God law can be used for every right desire in life. But to get back again to the skies for a moment, I should like here to try and give you an idea as clearly as I can of what these distances mean. You will never comprehend them because you cannot grasp such immensities. We are dealing with facts of the God law now, 
and it will be a long time before we can ever absorb mentally such distances and such powers as are these celestial distances and powers. I think I can, however, give you a faint inkling as to what I mean. I want you to imagine a chart, perfectly round and made of white paper. Imagine that chart being 300 yards in diameter. You can imagine 300 yards, all right, whereas you cannot imagine one light year. Here, we have then this big chart, 300 yards across. It is circular. Now, on this chart of ours, we make a spot about half an inch in diameter and we paint it black. That's half an inch on a round chart 300 yards in diameter. Pretty small, isn't it? That black spot, half an inch in diameter, we shall call our sun. You can grasp that easily, I think. Now take the point of a pin and make a tiny prick on the chart near the half inch black spot. And you have the earth. This is a crude illustration, but it brings within your understanding a faint picture of what the visible heavenly sphere is. That isn't all, however. It's only the beginning of the picture. If we started out today in an airplane traveling at the rate of 120 miles an hour and put the airplane out in the Earth's orbit, it would take over 500 years to make the complete circle of orbit if the Earth did not move any faster than that. Our winters would last nearly 200 years. So you can imagine from this speed at which this old ball of ours is traveling. When we get into the solar system, however, we run into vastly more staggering facts. For instance, this Earth turns on its axis at 1,000 miles an hour and travels in its orbit around the Sun at a rate of 1,000 miles a minute or 60,000 miles an hour. The distance from our Sun to the nearest fixed star is more than 20 billion miles. Can you grasp that? 20 millions of millions of miles. Of course you can't grasp it. But the God law I am here teaching you about can grasp it. In fact, that mighty law, which you are to use in your daily affairs, caused this created scheme of things I am explaining to come into existence. Take our chart again. This time we make one on the scale of half an inch to one million miles. In the other chart, we grasped a little about the size of our sun, but in this chart, it would take one over 500 miles in diameter in order to give us the distance to the nearest star. And then, we have not even begun to really get into space at all. 20 millions of suns floating around above and beneath us. Can you conceive of it? They are there. You can see thousands of them with the naked eye. Any clear night, is it any wonder I like to get out alone under the stars? I am near God then, and many a time I do it. There never was a fairy tale ever invented which could be as marvelous as this solar system of ours. Think of the Milky Way. Let me quote from R.A. Proctor's The Exposure of Heaven. These are stars in all orders of brightness, from those which, seen with a telescope, resemble in luster the leading glories of the firmament, down to tiny points of light only caught by momentary twinklings. Every variety of arrangement is seen. Here, the stars are scattered as over the skies at night. There, they cluster in groups as though drawn together by some irresistible power. In one region, they seem to form sprays of stars like diamonds sprinkled over fern leaves. Elsewhere, they lie in streams and rows, in coronets and loops and festoons, resembling the star festoon which in the constellation Perseus garlands in the black robe of night. Nor are the varieties of color wanting to render the display more wonderful and more beautiful. Many of the stars which crowd upon the view are red, orange, and yellow. Among them are groups of two and three and four, multiple stars as they are called, amongst which blue and green and lilac and purple stars appear, forming the most charming contrast to the ruddy and yellow orbs which they are commonly seen. And yet you and I look at the Milky Way and see nothing wonderful about it. I have oft times made the statement that the literal power of the God law is missed by countless millions on account of its simplicity. In making this revelation to you, I will be as careful as I can, and you on your part must follow me closely, carefully, and above all, you must be in earnest. The least you can do is to actually desire or want these good things of life, isn't it? I think thus far, however, you have followed me closely, and while right here there is a great temptation to go into the depths of the realm of astronomy. 
I shall refrain, for I think I have made my point by showing you that the great creator law is a bigger power than you ever thought it to be. For I shall show you a little later that this same God law, which directs the geese, which turns the robin's eggs into a robin instead of a scorpion, reacts with the same remarkable precision in your life. You are the one who sets the objective. The God law brings it into actual manifestation. So be prepared as we travel along together for what I shall show you. This same law, this same life spirit is operating here and now, right on this earth and right in our midst, as it operated millions of years ago when the very first tiny germ of life appeared on the earth. It is capable of making the fish swim away from the shark. It is capable of teaching the little ant to hole up for the winter. It is day by day manifesting its marvelous intelligence in a myriad of ways. And it is here for the express purpose of manifesting its intelligence in your own life. The bee that flits from flower to flower gathering its honey does not starve to death. The nightingale that floods the moonlit nights with melody is well taken care of. The tiny house sparrow, not one of them falls to the ground without this mighty God law. And you, 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 the most marvelous of all created things. Do you think for one moment that this God law cannot give you the things you need? Probably you have never looked at it this way. Probably you have never thought of it like this. Probably you have just bemoaned your fate and rested in the assurance that you would get by somehow in some way. Well, a little glimmer of light is coming to you now. And before you finish your studies with me, if you do not win from life the very best things it holds for you, it will be because you do not want to, and not because there is no God law governing your success. This is as far as I'm going to take you in this lesson, and I think you will admit that this is quite far enough for one lesson. I find it is a good idea in the studying of these lessons to read them some every day, and then do the exercise prescribed faithfully until you receive the next lesson. You have made up your mind what it is you need more than anything else in life. It may be health, it may be money, it may be domestic happiness, but you have made up your mind what it is. You are doing your deep breathing exercises. Better than all, however, you are relaxing and allowing this cosmic God law to take the desires from you and bring them into existence. Your whole thought every moment is that the God law is bringing to pass that which you need. You may now use whatever affirmation of truth best fits your case. Make the statements as if what you want is being brought to pass now. For instance, before I had received the actual physical realization of my desires, I used this affirmation hundreds of thousands of times. I am more and more successful. Never did I let up on that one statement. But in a future lesson, I shall tell you step by step just how I manifested from the God law everything I now have. Be earnest in your affirmation. Make it dynamic, for you are dealing with a dynamic law here, and the intense earnest attitude is very effective. Points to remember in lesson 5. 1. You know what it is you want to do or be. 2. You know that if you ever achieve these things, they will first be achieved in the realm of your own thought. 3. Your own thought you now know to be a little tiny part of creative invisible life spirit responsible for creation. 4. If this be a fact, then you also know that though you are only a little tiny piece of humanity, now as far as you go physically, the thought realm of you is part of an immense spiritual world fully capable of manifesting whatever few little things you may need on this earth to make you abundantly happy, healthy, and successful. 5. You will call this spiritual law into practice in your own life by the exercising in the thought realm. The little dynamic exercise I'm giving you to do are actually and literally giving you experience in contesting the greatest force the world has ever seen, the power of the God law. 6. The more your thoughts dwell upon the thing you want to be, the faster will the manifestation be, and the greater will be your hold on and your connection with the realm of God. And seven, I want to hear from students personally, and every letter sent is held in the strictest confidence by me. Under no consideration will their contents be divulged, and it may be that I shall be able to help you some. 
don't be backward about writing to me while you are studying with me. I am not infallible, nor do I possess any supernatural powers of any kind, but I do know a little about the operation of the God law in the lives of humans. Live a clean life. Be absolutely on the level with everyone. And if there is anything that needs cleaning up in your life, get it cleaned up. You will find the God law works more effectively when the thoughts are undiluted and free than it can if these thoughts are not that way. Sincerely, your friend and teacher, Frank B. Robinson. Examination questions for lesson number five. These examination questions are for your benefit and you should know the answers to them. If they are not clear to you, read your lesson again and again until they are clear. One, what have the facts of astronomy to do with one's understanding of the God law? Two, why is it vitally important for you to direct your thoughts into the proper channels? Three, how does it come that immaterialism has replaced materialism as a scientific concept? Four, give some illustrations of the influence of one's thought realm upon the physical body. Five, it will take more than a literary interest in the lessons to obtain anything from the spiritual realm. Six, what is the reason for your being shown in lesson five a few of the marvels of the skies? Seven, Mention some of the beliefs founded on statements made in the Bible which have been proved to be wholly erroneous. 8. What is a light year? 9. What purpose are you asked in Lesson 5 to imagine a chart 300 yards in diameter? 10. What should be the character of your affirmations? 11. Of what realm is your own thought realms a part? And 12. Why should your thoughts dwell constantly upon the thing you want to be? So this is a powerful lesson something that i do often is very important for you to do i mean don't you look up in the skies and just marvel at its immensity and the beauty of its creation millions and millions of planets and stars and the numbers he's giving are very low this is what he's giving from the 30s there were more planets discovered after this course was given and of course we know that there are more stars in the skies but this idea of the vast, infinite nature of the universe and the distances between stars and the size of these celestial objects all being a part of this infinite intelligence when grasped together is really amazing and should remind you that this God law that you're tapping into is infinitely and wonderfully powerful. So if you think that this thing that you're going through can't be resolved, that it's not resolvable, think again. Look up into the heavens and you'll see that this is not true. Anything is possible if you look at the amazing creation that we see. And he is clearly saying that we are tapping into this same law. So I would love to get your impressions of lesson five. It's just a good reminder and embracing of the power of the God law and how we simply don't fully comprehend the vastness of it. So let me know of your impressions so far. And I'd love to get your first person commentary. If you've tried the previous exercises in the psyche on lessons, if they have changed you, if you've noticed a connection to the God law, put them in the comments. I'll be definitely interested to see what you say. In any case, all episodes of the reality revolution can be found at the reality And welcome to the Reality Revolution.